Welcome everybody to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum's Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I am the Assistant Manager of Visitor Experience here at the museum. Thank you for joining us today and thank you to all of you who were here for part one or any of our uh, previous programs. Welcome back. It's always good to see everyone. This virtual series features programs about Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories about the trolley era that you can experience from home, uh, usually on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And we're going to continue these as long as we have presenters. So if you have a program you'd like to share that fits the museum mission, uh, please let me know. That'd be anything about Pennsylvania, the trolley era, cities where our streetcars come from, if you have a program that doesn't quite fit those guidelines, please reach out anyway. And we'll have a full list of upcoming presentations on our website at patrolley.org, which I will share in the chat box momentarily. And thank you very, very much to those of you who made a donation when registering tonight um, or throughout our web on our website throughout the year. We're very appreciative of your support, especially of our virtual programs. And uh, an introduction to the museum. We were established in 1954 at the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley fans called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And we opened to visitors just a few years later in 1963. We're located along the former inner urban between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. We've got almost 50 trolleys and electric railway cars, about 20 of which operate. And many of those will be operating during our upcoming Anything on Wheels event on Saturday. We just um, got our trolley parades set up. So we're going to have three different trolley parades on June 3rd with uh, lots of different cars that run. So there'll be a maintenance parade, a like out of towners parade, and then a Pittsburgh parade. So stay tuned. We'll talk about that more after the program. Um, we've got about 30,000 visitors coming to see us every year, taking the four mile scenic ride at the museum. All right, um, a couple updates. We're getting siding on the building, which is very exciting. It's making it look a lot more complete. Um, so this is where we had our members day and interim projects dedication just a few weeks ago on April 29th. If you go to patrolley.org under the uh, research tab, there's our website blog and you can read about the event there. And the picture on the right is kind of hard to tell what's going on. It's one of those 360 degree photos, but you can see they're putting up some drywall inside, getting everything um, set up and we're putting um, like boards inside and figuring out where to mount screens and artwork and all that kind of stuff. So it's moving right along, very exciting, still targeting end of this year sometime for um, an opening. And then on the left side there, um, one of our volunteers, Scott Davis, is painting the bulldoze on the safety island. All right, now without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter, George Gula. He grew up in both Philadelphia and Scranton, developing his trolley interests at a young age in Philadelphia. After graduating from Penn State with a degree in business logistics, he spent his entire career working in the transit business, first in Scranton, then in Pittsburgh, where he worked from 1975 till his retirement in 2008. And he joined the museum in 1975 and currently serves as an operator and a conductor here. He also volunteers in the archives and gives outreach programs and he's been writing for the member newsletter since 1977. And we're gonna be publishing a lot of George's articles um, on our blog that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Okay, and at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with George, but the chat box, chat box will be open throughout the program. So feel free to type any comments or questions or memories like we saw last time into the chat box and we'll go through those at the end. And this program is being recorded. We will share it to our YouTube within the next couple of weeks. And I'm gonna come along and turn off everybody's videos just uh, so we don't have any unnecessary distractions during the presentation. And uh, we'll invite you to turn those on and unmute yourselves at the end. And this weekend, this is your last chance to see this slide. We have the East Penn tra Traction Meet coming up in Allentown. Um, check it out at eastpenn.org. All right, George, if you are ready, take it away. I'm just looking for play. Here it is uh, up here. Can everybody see that and hear me? 
Yes. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, this is part two. Uh, there were, remember, two routes going into McKeesport from the city. And this was the fast way. This is the one that had a lot of private right of way. Um, I know some of you lived along the line as we look at all the contributors here. So if I'm wrong at a spot, you know, I've driven up and down this thing, but there's a lot of trees out there now and a lot of buildings that have been knocked down. And you guys might remember this. So here we go. Um, this was part, you know, as it was constructed, uh, it became part of the Second Avenue Traction Company. Um, and if you guys can see my, I haven't changed it. So it comes out of downtown, out Ross Street. There it is in Second Avenue. These were the neighborhoods of Hazelwood and Glenwood. Uh, this is where JNL Mill was. And we're going to see that uh, still in Pittsburgh as we cross the Monongahela River into the Hayes neighborhood. Um, and up the right of way, the first, the second set of private right of way. This was Calhoun Park. Uh, now it's a forest. Um, and uh, as we show up, we're going to cross uh, uh, Interborough Avenue and Mifflin Road again. And we're all the way down this private right of way into Dravosburg. And then over the Mansfield Bridge. Uh, don't forget, at one time, there was another bridge here in Dravosburg. And it, it goes all the way through McKeesport. Now, it was composed of a couple of, and I'm not going to go into every little tiny system, but uh, the McKeesport and Reynolds was one small system, and we talked a little bit about that last time. It was the line that was in the 10th Ward and into Glassport, ran down Fifth Avenue, and actually operated uh, over some West Penn trackage. Uh, the McKeesport and Reynolds uh, was down in the 10th Ward. And you can see, again, that's another shot from another Pittsburgh Railways map. Um, and uh, it only goes as far as the bridge. To get into town, uh, the, Glen, the Glenwood and Dravosburg was established to connect with the 2nd Avenue uh, traction line. This is all the private right-of-way that, that we'll see. This is Hayes up here, where the 55 cars cut off to go into Homestead. and I've never seen pictures of it, but there is a ramp that went down and went, uh, took trolleys into Braddock and Rankin along the Monongahela River. Um, and uh, then 2nd Avenue, and obviously 2nd Avenue traction uh, in the Glenwood neighborhood was the car house. Uh, There's actually a maintenance yard down in here along the river so they could get material in by barges. Uh, they are aligned to Greenfield left right here at Lotland Junction to be an Ogos right through there. And this disconnected track was the original track after the city built Irvine Street through. The trolleys went on Irvine Street, the mill closed off this property and it's still closed off today. And, you know, it, it'll come in, there's the 10th Street Bridge. And then they joined some other trackage uh, to get into downtown. And just one more map, but here we are in Second Avenue. And the cars went in this way on Diamond Street, which is currently Forbes Avenue. And they would turn back and come up Fourth Avenue um, and down onto Ross Street, you know, and under the Boulevard of the Allies Bridge uh, to head out Second Avenue. At one time, uh, for a while, some cars I think went up Third, but not very much. It wasn't Question much. Question from that. the chat, George: Was the Glenwood Bridge originally trolleys only? Do you know? As uh, far as I know, it probably had planking built on it. It was built, I think, in 1894 uh, by the Second Avenue system. Um, but I think that always had planking on it. Uh, because the only other way to get over there to the homestead side was uh, to go down um, um, Browns Hill Road and get into a ferry, Browns Ferry, and cross into the lower part of Homestead. So this bridge was very important. And uh, even though it was built by the streetcar company, you could take your wagons and light cars over it. We start at Pearl Street. I have a different view of that than the last time in 98 cars. It's just came off of uh, Fifth Avenue in the background and both 56 and 98 use this loop. And here it is coming in at Miller. Always takes wonderful wide views. It, it gives you an idea 
of some of the homes that that were surrounding it. This typical McKeesport housing, and there was parking lot, park and ride, so to speak. But at one time, there was a bar in the corner there and, and a gas station. So things getting knocked down. You can see right over here, uh, either a 98 or a 56 car getting ready to leave. Now, I did use this last week, last time, but it's a beautiful car and it's a shot and it's color and it, it shows all the mills. And so you get an idea of the already old neighborhoods that these cars were serving and uh, get a better idea of some of the older houses too. This is all under your highway now. You, you can't see it. I believe we may have gotten some track uh, from the loop underneath, but it's impossible to find it right now. So, but we'll leave Pearl Street it's back in 58. Um, and another view of it shows some of the apartments and public housing uh, that was being built there. And I did use this. There'll be a few downtown shots from last week. But again, it's a color view. We've left the loop. Uh, this is um, what Fifth Avenue looks like. This was the main street here. And it, and it you know, wasn't that wide. It is now. It's, I think, two lanes in each direction. Ed Miller captured the junction and the 68 cars uh, coming in from Oakland came in from the left. And, and this is what Pearl Street looked like. Some houses, so small businesses, and we will get onto Fifth Avenue. That was 1400, two slides ago, coming out of the loop. And, you know, it's already in trouble. As you can see, the lines painted there on the street were supposed to be guides to tell you, you know, how to park. Yeah, this car looks pretty wide. So maybe the cars are getting wider and this operator has a problem and this continued to go on right to the end of streetcars in 1963, okay? And Fifth Avenue will go left. A big road having off to heading off to the right is Lyle Boulevard, um, which was the rebuilt Jerome Street with a lot of buildings knocked down. Uh, there's a memorial in the background, uh, a cannon, and I'm shooting this picture from the cannon. That hillside is part of a huge cemetery. Uh, including some graves that are on the hillside. And there's the cannon. So there's some of that great dust. Now, 98s would follow this same route. 68s from Oakland and Homestead would also follow this route. So um, here's, here's the hospital. And as you can see, there's an older hospital back here uh, from late 1890s, probably. Here's the newer one probably from the 1940s or 50s. And there's even a newer one there now. This is very, this is much at Evans Avenue because Evans Avenue goes up the side um, of those hospital buildings. Comment uh, from the chat, George. Um, huh. Paul says the stripes are probably also for the operator. So he or she could see it, if, see if it was safe to pass. Yeah, well, yeah. But, but sometimes the cars were just a bit too wide. McKeesport, you, you wouldn't believe this today. If you go down Fifth Avenue today, there's Lyle Boulevard on the left. If you go down Fifth Avenue today, uh, there are times when you can shoot a cannon down the street, and not hit anything. A lot of these buildings have been knocked down or otherwise, you know, have, have been downgraded. Uh, the department stores are all gone. For example, Hirschberg, the banks. Um, it's not the busy business street it used to be. And, you know, one time there were tons of small businesses, you know, five movie houses, I believe eight uh, department stores. G.C. Murphy's had its headquarters back on this side of the crossing uh, here in the flagship store in here. Um, this was Balsamo's, a major uh, destination for a lot of people, food market. Uh, here's that infamous railroad crossing. And there was a constant battle here for uh, possession of the streets. And, uh, you know, the hospital end of McKeesport was very narrow. Um, kind of very old, old buildings in here. Uh, it not This is not, of course, the downtown shopping area. Uh, but it was still pretty vital. And uh, quite a few of these buildings have been torn down now. And I threw this in just to show that I think we used it last week. But Green Walls is here. And look at all the people standing around. I wonder if they're all trying to get onto that yellow car. 
the movie district, I think at least three of the movies were here. Uh, one was in here. And I think the Liberty was over here. And you could tell because the movie, the movie theater painted its sidewalk. Busy place. It's, this is a 56 car. Uh, and I think we're heading inbound here. And look at that. You can see the cars trying to adhere to the lines. Follow the rules. But still, you know, the trolleys took a little while to, to get by as we head over. This is the Liberty, I think, up here. Right there, I believe. The Victor was near here, too. There's Isley's and Petoskey's. And I think we're down near St. Clair Street and very close to the crossing. The railroad crossing, that infamous nasty crossing, is down there. There's all the, a lot of the major department stores on the other side of the crossing. And here's Ed Miller's shot. I'm using this because it shows the business district. Um, at St. Clair, right up, right near the crossing, about one block from the railroad crossing. And it gives you an idea of the many small businesses that dominated the street uh, in this town, you know, credit clothing, you know, clothiers. And uh, now the railroad crossing that we showed last week, and uh, we, we talked about the 68 and how the railways totally refused uh, to abide by city council's continuous demands to um, have their cars get out of the loop area and cross the crossing you down and try to turn in the 10th ward. And, uh, but 56 was stuck doing that. And so is the 98. They, they were always tied up by trains, 13 streets, I believe, were across the main streets, tied up fire engines, tied up ambulances, and there was almost always a police officer, mostly this guy at Balsamos. And this guy was very famous. And I did the, uh, the show today um, in Washington. I did one on the Washington line. And there was a fellow up at the uh, senior home, and he remembers living in McKeesport. He said, everybody knew this one cop. And I said, was that Babe Sharanahan? Sharanahan, he, yep, that's who it was. So this gentleman knew there's the Murphy's. J.C. Murphy's offices, you know, uh, Goodman's was here. Um, Stephen uh, Scalgo let me use this. And really, really, it's a good shot. There's the B&O station. Of course, passenger trains would come through and they'd make multiple stops. Stop for the baggage cars, you know, stop for the coaches. Maybe stop for a Pullman on certain, certain um, um, trains. Now, here's all the shopping. Um, Kaplan's was a jewelry store, I believe. It was owned by the family of Judge Kaplan. There's Balsamo's again. And just look at all the traffic. That, you know, this shot just amazes me. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the netting, that was so if a trolley pole came off, it was an arc netting and it would keep the pole electrified to get the car off the crossing. And street traffic everywhere, all well dressed. Look at the fins on those cars. Um, this was used last week. This is showing the blockade of these slow moving coal trains dragging through town. And I mentioned I had a friend that, that uh, lived out there and she and her brothers would uh, really, they're going to church in the morning. Why, why do you want to go to church? I hope a train comes. And when the train came, they were quietly very happy. And they, uh, they all said a number. This is the number of cars in the train. And then they counted them. Now her father was a former World War II veteran, Bronze Star, and he just fumed at this. You know, here's a caboose leaving. And of course, as we mentioned last time, the catastrophes were hospitals on one side, the heart attacks on the other, fires on one side, fire engine on the other. Um, this crossing was a real pain cutting through town. And a railways company would have to have the responsibility to maintain the crossing, and of course, they had their own tie-ups here when they did this. There's a yellow car, uh, probably a 99, but uh, crossing. There's the star on the left. The star was a restaurant that you kind of dressed up for, and, and uh, they said it was pretty good. And this railroad crossing would be taken out about 1970, um, and the tr uh, and the trains, the B&O trains, rerouted onto the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, and they would they would 
take a circuitous route around town. Here's a, a great shot. There, the gates are down. Always a policeman at this um, intersection. There was a Rexall here, you know, Murph. There's Murphy's flagship store was right in here. That was their first store. Just another shot that way. Different policeman, though. Bookstore on the corner. I uh, knew somebody that worked there. There's Kaplan's. Um, Rubens was down here. All of the furniture, um, they sold furniture here. Uh, and that's a painted car coming across. A little bit better, Hirschberg's. Of course, Murphy's was a five and dime, five and dime store. Very busy. We're up uh, the next stop. There's Cox's. Cox's was one of the eight department stores. And two days a year, one day in the spring, one day in the fall, they had a fashion show. And models models would walk along this uh, platform. Uh, notice there is no protection at all. And they would, uh, you know, people would gather down on the street, I'm sure add to the congestion, watching the models go by modeling the latest uh, fashions. And I found this in my collection and it, what this really shows, yes, it's just a little bit of the streetcar, but I mean, look at everybody on the sidewalk down there, you know, everybody well-dressed. I mean, it's really an amazing picture. And I think you can almost see everybody, you know, walking back and forth, the trolley gong ring and the automobile traffic and horns. It's just a very animated picture. Um, there's some of the department stores that were down there and they're all in, in this area. Uh, Cox's, Rubens, Famous, Hirschberg's, Helmstetter's, Helmstatter's, Emmel's, Jason's, and Montgomery Ward all down in here. And it's not a 56 car, but it, it's a glass a glass board car. Probably that's a 56 down here, or it could be a 98. Um, but this just showed that area very, very nicely. And we're looking uh, eastbound or outbound toward a crossing. Just a very, and it's still very narrow down on its end. Just because you cross the railroad doesn't mean it, it widened. And if you look really carefully on this beautifully congested street, there's a Route 68 inbound car just starting to sneak out of Locust Street um, on its way back uh, into downtown. There is, uh, now this is 1467. Anybody know where that is today? Because I believe it's down at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. And there's a, uh, the Fine and Dime store that was uh, Greens and Jasons uh, back in there was a clothing store, and the Western National Bank would eventually become uh, PNC, Pittsburgh National Bank. There's the memorial one block away. Here comes the Chrysler car. Um, somewhere, and I don't think it operated out of Glenwood, but somewhere I have a painted car picture. And there is a Dugan running for district attorney. And I have to wonder, is he related to the Dugan that is currently running? Today's election day, of course. And here's Market Street. And the inbound cars are going to turn here to the left. You can see that. The cars heading outbound, um, they're going to turn one block behind me. This is Market. Um, they're going to turn on a small dinky street called Strawberry. And there's Rick's. That was a major drugstore down there. And of course, you have to deal with some of the, the fact that some people didn't have great cameras. The famous. And this is a 98. And he should be going outbound. And for some reason, he's turning inbound on Market Street. And the famous, of course, had a major fire about 1976. I have no idea if he's turning because he's so late. That he's just going back to the end of the line. No idea. Uh, a block down Market Street. Now we're on Lyle Boulevard. He's heading outbound. There's a famous in the back again. Or he's heading inbound. Pardon me. And if you look down the block, um, there is the in the outbound track. And uh, so the the streets were so narrow. Um, 
between La Boulevard and Fifth Avenue uh, that they thought better of having double track down there. And and here it is on that. I'm sorry, it was in Strawberry. It was Mulberry. And there's the Lyle Boulevard Bridge in the back. The big black bridge is the PNLE Bridge, uh, on which the tracks on which the B&O trains were rerouted. Uh, the Jerome Street Bridge was built by Allegheny County um, in about 1939 or so, maybe a little bit earlier. And uh, it replaced a pretty rickety bridge here. I think that bridge just got reconditioned a few years ago. So Ed Miller walked up this little hill on Romine Street, and uh, you can see the major buildings in McKeesport. And this is the junction of the old and the new Route 56 line. So if you're crossing this bridge, the original trolley line went over this bridge, over the Pianelli Railroad, there were several routings through this area here, but they all got to Atlantic Avenue and then it would go off and then onto an old, an old low kind of rickety bridge um, that needed re be, to be replaced 10 years before they could do it. The Glassport cars always took West Fifth Avenue and when they opened the Mansfield Bridge, this is where the 56 would run and all the trolleys would, would come out of here. So we're looking at this junction area. Actually, you can see the uh, switch hasn't been taken out yet. That's the uh, 10th Ward over to my right, or left rather, pardon me. And another view looking the other way. So there's the hill Ed Miller uh, stood on. And if you walked all the way up Romine, it is pretty steep. 10th Ward is down to my right, and they've replaced that with, I believe, ramp number one. There are two ramps to go into 10th Ward now. They've eliminated all the railroad crossings, and it's ramp one and ramp two. So very original names to get in there. But here's what it did look like. Um, and the 56 cars would turn um, to the right and cross that bridge. That's their original routing and uh, then start coming down here and then there would be different routings between these buildings to get to Atlantic Avenue. There's the Glassport line up in front of me and the county is doing work on the bridge. That's why this photo um, was taken, uh, three bridges, because there were trolleys at one time on this third, third, third Avenue bridge, that's the suspension bridge and uh, only light cars though could operate on it. Look how Look how dense that place is. Look how busy uh, it is. And they did plank that bridge so that uh, drays and later automotive vehicles could go across. Here's here's a view of that planking. Sure, it made a little bit of a thundering when, when you went over it. And then you came down and, and it was this. Now, this is obviously before... <laughs> this is 1946. And notice there's no real street there yet. Um, so that planking was put in later. And uh, the tracks would divide and, and go different ways to get to Atlantic Avenue. And this is on, uh, I believe this really is Fifth Avenue, not in the 10th Ward. So I will shift this later on. My mistake. But this is uh, Fifth Avenue as well. You can see the bridge in the back, you can see there was a crossing here, there was a tower. Um, at one point, uh, I think there was a single track crossing, I think it was Ann Street, uh, but it wasn't that used and it was eventually taken out. This is the reconstruction um, of Fifth Avenue, West Fifth Avenue. Um, now, somebody had said to me last time, isn't there any other shots at the 10th Ward? And I dug this up. Uh, it's a county photo and it's taken during all this construction and rebuilding the wall, they're rebuilding the bridge behind me. Um, you can see the 56 car, one of the tracks coming in over here uh, during this construction. I believe the Glassport car has ended here and just went back and forth. But there's a little bit more of the 10th Ward. I don't know if you live there, but if you're with us, take a look at it and tell me. Be interested. Uh, can you tell what that box car in the background is there? No. Okay. I can see he's probably at a spur. Uh, remember, we used to ship a lot of freight by 
by car, including what was known as a less than carload lot. Uh, they didn't have to fill the boxcar with all of your stuff. They would move it along with other people's stuff. So I'm sure there's a spur back in there. Um, not well used because you just have a set of cross bucks uh, here. And then the cars would go down as we showed last week um, or two weeks ago, they headed down Atlantic Avenue and this is near, near at Windsor Street. And a lot of these buildings I believe are gone now. Here was the end of the line for 99 cars when they rerouted into the 10th Ward from Evans Avenue. Go around that curve and a block or two away and uh, that's where the old bridge started. And then of course, I have to remember to put this in my women in transit shot because you've got a Pittsburgh Railways operator motorette in her uniform in color. Uh, and notice both poles are up. Um, you never want to leave poles down. Air could bleed off. And uh, we've had in Pittsburgh over the years some serious accidents with that. Now, the old Dravosburg Bridge, that old thing, probably built in the 1890s. And we're looking from a point well, roughly a little bit before the Mansfield Bridge is reached. You can see this. And the road traffic is to dive down and cross the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, Pittsburgh Railways had their own trestle, pretty long, pretty extensive one that would reach Maple Avenue and head over to Richland Avenue. And I've got some pictures of that, different ones. And you really spent some money. Um, the bridge, you know, would dive down, as you can see, and the tracks merged there onto the bridge. And uh, then there was a curve. And uh, as soon as we see how extensive that is, I mean, there's people who look at this show and they're not uh, trolley buffs and they can't believe the money that was spent um, to get a car line over. Um, this is the McKeesport side. You can see the, the, the bridge here, you know, Lyle Boulevard, the Dramone Street Bridge. But I don't know what some of these buildings are. Certainly that's not up there as far as I know. I haven't seen it, so. I'm not sure what it is. Here we are coming off. Charlie Dengler, one of our early members. He was a mailman. And, and once he finished delivering, you know, he was able to go out and take pictures. And he took his camera with him in his mailbag. So nobody else walked out on this bridge. But he did. <laughs> so he had to walk on the ties, obviously. And here's that curve. You can almost hear that car squealing. Around the curve is another view of it. So that's all Dravosburg in the back. And it was a hilly town. And one more, I think, on, on the curve. This You could see how extensive that, that structure was. As we're going to turn onto this. Now, we have a set of photos like this in the archives. None of them are clear, unfortunately. But it does show enough. Uh, the curve is over here and you can still see this wall today. You can still see this, you know, the right of way is there. And up until about 10 years ago, so were the tracks here. Uh, they're, they've just been paved over, they're under there. Uh, but this is what it looked like. And you went down Maple Avenue for several blocks, half a mile. And then, and here's Maple down here. And uh, you can see, I think they're building the Mansfield Bridge. So it's going to cover this. But it went through this cut up a hill and through this cut. And you came up here. Here's Elizabeth Street, which is still there. So the Mansfield Bridge is pretty much going to cover and remove all of this. Uh, and then you're on Richland Avenue. There's the Richland Cemetery. Um, I found out this was a church that burned. Uh, somewhere in the early 1960s. This area on the hill is a small shopping center now. And there's the old bridge. And you can probably see it. it's not the greatest photo because somebody sent me a, a newspaper uh, clipping that they, they uh, copied. But here's the bridge going in and it's going to wipe out all of this right away and a whole bunch of stuff. Here's Elizabeth Street and here's Richland, it'll run into Pittsburgh, McKeesport Boulevard. Somewhere up by the cemetery, the trolley's gonna cut off here. 
Uh, Ray yeah. Steffens mentioned he saw old Bettis Airfield in one of those photos. Oh, really? Where was where was that? Maybe let's see. Yeah, let us know in the chat, Ray. Ellis, oh, well, does he mean this? Is this airfield here? Am I pointing? To, am yes. I pointing? I am. He says yes. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. And we're building that bridge. It's almost like like our visitor center. It's almost there, and you can take a it's a good view of the uh, trestle. Uh, though in the background, and and there's a PCC heading over the trestle. Now, they'll open that trestle in 1950. It will open the Mansfield Bridge. The trestle comes down, um, and you can see they've built another bridge to replace that trolley bridge. And and we're running running down Fifth Avenue at the Elbow Room, and I believe that restaurant and bar is still there. Um, Kristen, the, the safety island that we have, did I hear that that was from McKeesport? The one that we installed? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I remember Scott saying that the the form hadn't been used since the 60s, so I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Maybe, maybe someone from PTM knows. All right. I'm just wondering. Thought maybe one of these could be it. And ramp two is right up here the end of the 10th ward and it's another gas station now, but there still is a gas station here. And we're getting pretty close to the Mansfield Bridge. There it is. Um, Glassport cars rolled off to the right, and went underneath uh, the bridge and the McKeesport 56 cars, you know, actually use this upper part. Here's the US Steel Irvine Works, uh, which is still in operation. And just another view at that area. Different view. Now we're coming up there. There were, if you look at glassboard photos on the other side, you'll notice there were all these scrapyards on both sides of the Mansfield Bridge. They line the river. Here's something else that probably was polluting things over here. So the industry was all over the place um, in this area. And of course, they're probably having a railroad spur in here too. We're along the Pittsburgh um, and Lake Erie Railroad there. And we'll head onto the bridge, and you know, there's uh, Dravosburg off to the right of the bridge. Another shot of that. That'll show you the extent, you know, the the vast extent of the bridge, and and there's the Urban Works and all the uh, barges. It's like about twelve barges uh, sitting on the river there, and probably one more shot on this and this to you know, give you an idea of what it looked like. Now we're on the bridge. We're really on the Dravosburg side. Notice there's a, that's a buildings in Dravosburg, like this school that I don't even believe are there now. Um, and uh, here's the safety island in the middle um, of uh, the bridge, bridge in the start of Richland Avenue. Here's another shot of it. Opening day is what, this was supposed to be, but I don't think it is because opening day pictures taken by the county were very, very, very congested. Still probably not to the concrete's clean, so probably not too far away. And there's that safety island. And here's that church um, right here that I mentioned. Um, now a different color, obviously, but that would be burned. Um, and I think this building, this building here was the Vicarage Parsonage. Here's where the shopping center is. And we are at Third Avenue. And over to my right and out of view is the Rich is the Richland Cemetery. But there it is. There's the cemetery. And the fur place obviously went out of business. It's a pizza shop now. That business is the building is still there. And it's at Beach Alley. And we're heading up Richland. Uh, these buildings here, well, at least this building is still here. I was able to track it down last week, took a drive out there. And the cemetery has a few interesting people lying around, including one person, who, if anybody knows anything about the Custer fight in June of 1876, you'll know that Custer's men fought at one area and Major Reno's battalion fought at another. And, uh, a gentleman who survived the Major Reno part of the fight is buried in that cemetery. 
and we're heading here's that church again so roughly around uh beach alley but these houses aren't there anymore and we're getting to where we will come on to private right of way our first uh group piece of private right of way i think uh outside of the trestle there's the cemetery and i am going to leave and i am immediately going to go over this bridge and that's the union railroad uh, heading down to Clariton and uh, going over to the Urban Works. Um, and that car will continue downhill, even as the road goes uphill. And there was a small lake called Sandy Lake down there. And it was actually about six houses uh, down in there as well. And you can still take it now, take your pictures now. Supposedly, you know, that that major road is coming through at some point. But right now you can still take a look at the track sitting in the bridge. Here's another view of it as we head down into the woods. And that track is still there in the paving. Better view of the bridge. So now you know where you, where, where you are. And one more shot. So there's the Union Railroad with tracks going to the Urban Works uh, and more track heading down to Clariton here. Uh, the line separates, I think, down in that area. But Now, there was a horseshoe down in here. Nobody ever walked in to take pictures of Lake Emily. Um, or not Lake Emily, but, but Sandy Lake. Lake Emily is another lake there. Um, I suspect they all walked down the track, went down the stairs to the Grandview Trestle Stop, and walked down the track. And this weather isn't here yet. Um, cars went both ways. I'm sure they squealed down there a nice summer shot and uh a nice crappy fall shot but it provided when the leaves were off the trees it provided more light if you had slower film uh we used this once in the calendar it's a fred schneider shot and uh fred liked to put people in his uh you know in his in his scenes now at this point I'm looking at a car who's just come down a long, a long grade from the Grandview Trestle. Notice the house. Uh, and I said there were about six houses down there. One of the homes was owned uh, by the caretaker of the cemetery. So it was a very easy way to go to church. Um, there was also a path that led from the right, from off to the right, which Pittsburgh Railways maintained. And that took you up to Pittsburgh McKeesport Boulevard and Bettis Road. There's a better view of the house. And somebody's waiting there. It's a nice convenient stop. Now, no real good path, but it was a stop. And that's that straightaway leading up the hill. And uh, you can see the house on one side. And way up at the top, that track is going to curve. We're going to be at something called White House Stop. And there's the White House. I suspect they named it for. And we'll start curving over and then, well, one more better shot of it, but but we're coming uphill. This kind of hill, this hill could be very treacherous on an icy day. There are photos in the archives of lines of streetcars, yellow cars mostly, you know, backed up uh, because of the ice uh, on the track. Now you can see behind the car is what was known as Grandview Trestle. That took Lebanon Church Road um, over um, Pittsburgh Railways. And uh, there was a stop here, one set of stairs in the crude area to stop at. Certainly that's Lebanon Church. This is not a fan trip, it's the real thing. It gives you some details of the um, trestle. Now, if you so look right at this up. area today. Oh, sorry, George. Uh, oh, Joe noticed ice on the overhead in, in the picture. There's no, a... I don't know if there's ice on the overhead. Where? Oh, Here? I don't know. He just said ice on the overhead. Why well, are there? Gee, I don't know. There's a lot of snow, though. Yeah. <laughs> Now, if you go through here today, now, when I when I came to Pittsburgh and began working at the Port Authority, they were doing a massive check of all the running times on the system. And they were 
trying to comply with the union's request because the union said, hey, you know, nobody's changed the running times since trolley days and the traffic is very different at many points. And so I spent a lot of time riding the Route 56 bus different times, the day, you know, taking times, counting people. And I asked a number of operators who had worked this line where it crossed under and they showed me. And it was only been abandoned about 13 years and it was relatively, you know, except for brush, it was easy to see. Go over there today and it's not easy to see. And on the other side, uh, that side, we looked at uh, the straight line. They took a sewer project in there uh, to make it harder to find. But I do know where it is. Uh, thankfully, the old operators were very happy to talk about their experiences. And uh, one more, I think, here, rumbling along. Gets a good, good view of what the trestle looked like. They filled all this in, of course. Now, yeah, there's problems. I don't know what this milk driver was drinking, probably not milk, but uh, he crashed down somehow onto the tracks and he's got everything blocked. Now, you'll go through a little bit of woods or brush, not very much, uh, and you'll come up a little bit of a hill and now you're in the Morton plan. Now the Morton plan, uh, as I understand it was begun about 1903 or four and a group of investors uh, in the railway company laid this out uh, so you could get business. And this is Elmwood Avenue. And this is really the good place to shoot. There was a shelter back here, not very good, not very nice shelter as you can see, but uh, they were all like this. Um, and I've driven this and you can see this right of way clearly. Uh, today. And I am looking towards Lincoln Place, looking towards an up on car that uh, I think is Adams Avenue on my right. Um, that that whole road system in the back is for a church. It's still there. The shelter is not. And I will roll down from the Morton plan, which is here. I'm gonna go straight down and I'm gonna cross Buttermilk Hollow Road here, right here. There's the Union Railroad. So what I'm doing, I'm sorry, this is Lincoln Place. It's an outbound car. The Morton plan is behind me, but the factory tricked me. And uh, this was put in this, you know, whole project, including the bridge, was put in by the county. If you go down this way today, it's Buttermilk Hollow, and Bettis Road is here, and these, both of these abutments are still here. So you could view them, view them today. You can take pictures of them, um, or you can just wonder why in the heck they're there. But this is what it used to look like before the county got involved. Here's the Union Railroad, and you know, Pittsburgh Railways was looping through here. And essentially, Buttermilk Hollow didn't seem to exist in any usable form. And the county got involved. You can see the railways. You can see the original bridge. Um, and they built and widened the road about 1938 or 9. Uh, the Pittsburgh Railways put a temporary track around the project as the abutments were built. And the, you know, the bridge was placed and there is the completed bridge and a much widened road. And the way to go to Kennywood, if you were on Bottom Round Collar, was to turn off to the right. Well, then the railway cars leave that bridge and they go up this beautiful straight right away. Uh, there's a slag train and uh, it's probably going to the slag dump uh, where Century 3 Mall was constructed. And look at that beautiful arrow straight right away. It's from the Union Bridge. It's obviously an outbound car. But they I was told they really rolled up this hill. Another shot. There's a stop in here, of course. Uh, now, I believe that's the Morton plant up here. And one more shot of that. Uh, it looks really good. I mean, these guys really rolled uh, up here. 
Now you you got up to the end, you know, Interboro Avenue. Yeah, Interboro Avenue extension ends about here. And I was out here and over to my right off the picture are baseball fields, which are now soccer fields. They're still fields. And uh, that house took me a while to sit and stare at it. I don't know that the owner liked it, but I finally realized he had done a lot of remodeling, added stuff over here, changed his garage, uh, but it was the same place. Now, when you roll through this area, the right of way is private. The Interboro Avenue extension is up on a hill on my left. And there seems to be an unnamed street down here with several houses. And it was an interesting area. The stairs are no longer there, but you know, I was staring um, at a picture I had and this house showed up and the woman really wanted to know what in the hell I was doing there. So I said, where were the stairs? And she just pointed down here. So I was able to uh, figure out where they were. That's Interboro Avenue on the left. Um, and the car is another nice black and white shot of it. There were signals, of course, here. And down below is a dead unnamed street where there are houses. And uh, now I'm an outbound car back down below Buttermilk Hall Road and, and uh, parts of Munn Hall start up in there. Parts of West Mifflin are down there. Um, and you can see some of the houses on that kind of unnamed little area down there. It's a tiny street. It's a path. And then you're going to round this curve. And you're going to get level with Interboro Avenue. This is at Rogers, um, Rogers Street. And the Church of the Nazarene is still in this area. Uh, what's neat is Interboro Avenue still does this. And if you want to drive on a trolley right away along a curve for a few hundred feet, um, it is dirt, but you can do it. It's it's in pretty good shape. You won't do anything bad to your car. And around that curve is, there's the Church of the Nazarene. And around that curve, we're going to approach Muldowney Avenue. And you can see a switch in front of the car because Muldowney Loop um, is off to my left. Now, Art Ellis remembered that prior to World War II, they installed Mold, Muldowney Loop. And now they were able to run short turn cars uh, called 56 A's uh, through Hayes and Glenwood and Hazelwood, really congested areas, and turn them here. When PCCs came to Route 65, uh, the Munhall line, uh, they were extended on the 56 line a little bit, not much, you'll see, and they turned here as well. For that, uh, a car had to run empty all the way down in a keysport to turn around. So I'm looking in the direction the pa uh, former car is going, and that is Muldowney Avenue. And that building, I think, is still there. And we're heading the other way. Here's the switch um, for Muldowney Loop. And I'll cross Muldowney Avenue here. Now, it, it's going to go through. This area, this area the car just came from is still there and not nearly as eroded. And uh, I think two shots ago might have been over actually on uh, Mifflin Road, but but this is definitely Muldowney. And uh, there's how the car is turned into the loop. I think that's a 65 car and it's a path. You can take uh, this area here, as you see, it's a path um, and school kids the school down there and, and kids walk it. Um, and again, it's not nearly as eroded. They're trying to keep that path in good shape and pretty clear and well lit. So this car is going to turn into the loop. You can see it's a 56A. Now there was a crossover in here. And uh, so Route 65 cars um, could go to the loop and they would turn around in the loop you know, and come back on the track that your 56 car is on. But then they crossed over and they would continue down Interboro Avenue. Uh, 65 had sightings, five sightings, I think, and a lot of single track. Ah, uh, this was one of our members, Ollie Miller's picture. And yeah, this is at Mifflin Road. So I will move that other one with the red building here as well. We're coming out onto Mifflin Road and, uh, 
which is it there. There's that red building. Of course, Mifflin's pretty narrow today or back then. And uh, another view of it, um, some people like to see the buildings. That's Route 65 here, though, and it's coming down and it, the track will cross over and, and connect. This guy is coming out of what is today a Sunoco station. Um, although I walked behind that once uh, in a winter when I thought the ticks weren't out. And you can see one or two line poles. Now, here's the school. It's Park School. I've just come through that little cut. I'm crossing Mifflin Road, or I'm going to get ready to do that. And Park School is still there as a landmark. Ah, I did that twice. See, I that's where it should have been. My bad. But we're heading down into that area, and the Chrysler car showed up. And thinking about the shot in McKeesport where we had a painted car, I remember seeing five years. So this is 1451, uh, painted up as Chrysler. Uh, here's Mifflin Road. Here's an outbound car. Uh, one more shot of it. It's a broader shot. Almost looks like an Ed Miller shot, but I don't believe it is. That's all Shinoko today. Uh, parking lots, gas pumps. And we're going to go down that. And then Art Ellis took this shot. And I just love it. Back in the yellow car days. Now, the car on the right, that's where the old Route 65 laid over before they uh, installed PCCs. Uh, there was a siding here, and this part of the siding was on the sidewalk, and you would change ends, and then you would head back, uh, just like we we would do at the museum. One more shot, 1090 coming out of that. Now we're going to dive into an area that originally had a park. That was Calhoun Park. I've never seen pictures of Calhoun Park. I don't know what type of a park it is, but off to my right is the Sunoco station. And the pole with the signal is still there. I don't think the signal is there, but the pole is there in the weeds. And, uh, you know, this is what that area looked like. Diving down in. Eventually, I believe I have a shot showing you what happened. Right now, it's a big area filled with stone and you wouldn't know anything was there. But it was a very bucolic area at one time. And there over on your left are trailers. Mm -hmm. It became a trailer park uh, at one point. Now, this is in the 60s, and I only arrived in 1975. But I do remember a request about two years ago. Somebody had a picture. It wasn't this one, but where is it? And I eventually found it. <clears throat> uh, and I believe Ray Janosko was the person that put me onto this, that Oakleaf Avenue was over here, and there was a set of steps up through here. You can see them here going up to Leaside Avenue. This is Ray's neighborhood. Uh, so, Ray, you can put in a chat is this really Glenhurst Street? I think it is based on the houses, but of course, it looks very different now. More trees. And I think this is Glenhurst on the other, coming up the other way. Uh, the poles obviously painted white. Um, so drivers won't hit them. I was told Mifflin Road was very narrow and you could pass automobiles, but slowly. And there were times when it could be busy here. Um, somebody's driveway going up there. So Mifflin Road has been widened, obviously. It encroaches on at least some of the right of way. You can see how narrow the road was. This is 1959. Um, and it's still very narrow and very slow. And on a weekday, uh, I was told it could be pretty heavy traffic. And we're going to glide down this hill all the way down Mifflin Road. A lot of people took a lot of pictures here. It was easy to access. Looked like an inner urban, which is what everybody wanted. There's 1630, which means it might have been a fan trip. And this is Mooney Road. Mooney Road, uh, after you leave Route 885, is the first road to go up. I've never gone up over it, but it is still there. And now we're getting closer. As you can see, now look how, look how narrow Mifflin Road was. And we're nearing Pennsylvania Route 885. Uh, for bus aficionados, that's uh, the road where uh, West Mifflin 
garage is located. And well, it takes about five or six minutes to get down here. Not the greatest shot, but also it's a nice wide shot showing the tracks entering uh, Mifflin Road. And 885 is over on my right. Not everybody had the great, wonderful digital cameras that we do have today. And it's wonderful when you find somebody who's taken pictures, even with very slow film. Sometimes I think it was Kodak ASA 10, uh, which had a hard time capturing moving things uh, because none of this really exists anymore. It's a better shot of it coming into the, uh, you know, motors being very cautious as the car pulls in into the middle of the street. This street is still, still Mifflin Road. And we'll look the other way. There's 885 off to the left. And uh, traffic is still very bad through here. It's still very narrow uh, through here, although you don't contend with the streetcars. And see again, another wide shot. Somebody didn't have great film or they didn't have a great lens. And, uh, and a lot of people had cameras that were kind of miserable by today's standards. But there's a total view of how it entered. And then some of these houses are still there. And I know because I looked at them last week. <clears throat> and it's near, it's approaching Hayes School. That should be on my right. And there it is. Hayes School is still there. It's not a school now. Some of these old homes, believe it or not, are still there. That changes as we go farther down into the Hayes neighborhood. Um, there is behind me a massive expressway that took out most of the neighborhood. Um, and so everybody could run from the suburbs, you know, straight through Hayes uh, and onto the Glenwood, the new Glenwood Bridge. Uh, but in the old days, and this road is still there, you could still, you know, rumble along like this streetcar under the uh, streets run branch, the Beano Railroad. There it is. And for years, there was a set of crossings, this crossings. I think they're buried under pavement here, but they were still there. They were still there. Now, when you look at this, this is Baldwin Road. In the back is the Hayes Ammunition Plant. That was built by the um, Navy in 1942. Mesta actually did the operation of the plant. They made 16 in shells. And if you're a World War II buff, that means battleships, the Iowa, the Missouri, uh, or some of the old Arizona type um, battleship. That's that's this was before the expressway, though, the main road to get to the Glenwood Bridge. Now, Jim Schumann was a really wonderful guy. And, you know, he had an eye just like Ed Miller. We're seeing. So we're going to see three scenes. And this is Baldwin Road. And the railroad spur down in the concrete is still there. And that's about the only thing here you can tell where you are. Plus, this is Holy Angels Church. And until the parishes all merged, they had one of the best fish sandwiches in Pittsburgh. That's Holy Angel School. That's gone. Almost all of these buildings are gone. I'm looking from the streets run branch of the B&O Railroad, and he followed the car. And where those houses are, particularly on the hill, they're all gone. That's a super highway coming through. And he moved along again. That that tan building isn't there. All these homes in the back are not there. And, you know, these were taxpayers that uh, assisted the city in its expenses. And I'm sure the mindset of the developers was, well, these are all slums. You know, we don't need these old houses and nothing really developed. There's probably 300 or less or fewer people um, living here in Hayes today. Now, you know, Philly has its tunnel and people go in the tunnel and they went pretty far in the tunnel. And apparently they had enough problems here that the sign was up for streetcars only. But here it would have been easier to drag them off if they followed the trolley in, that's Baldwin Road over on my right. And it will, as you see, parallel the ammunition plant um, and the trolley here. They're running together. This is all what looks like what is in here today. Here's the old Glenwood Bridge here. Uh, this spur, though, is still here. 
that's still there. And that was the main road. So when it got busy, but that plant, I mean, which closed, I think about mm, 70, 71, um, provided a lot of jobs, as you can see, thousand jobs. Uh, they finally got rid of, uh, the army finally disposed of their ownership uh, in the early 80s. But here's the main road through Hayes. Trolley rolls along and we get to this junction. This is 8th Avenue, West 8th Avenue. Um, and what happened here was Route 55 cars swung in from the left uh, and joined Route 56. And you get a good view of the right of way. It's a red slide. I tried to get as much of the, you know, the nasty red out, but but these early ectochromes, blues would a lot of times disappear. Now, I remember coming down here once before the Sandcastle Water Park was opened. The expressways behind the houses that are not there now, off to my left. But these houses were there, and there was track here. And there was even boards under the railroad bridge where the overhead wire could be supported and protected from touching the steel. And uh, so I thought, hey, that's pretty good. And I had to put this in. Another view of it. All these things disappeared when Sandcastle opened. This is the way to get into the water park now. Uh, certainly the old Glenwood Bridge does not line up with the current um, the Glenwood Bridge. Now, I think I have signage here. Okay, uh, load limit was 10 tons. Speed limit was 15. The bridge was getting old. And uh, I do like that one. Travel at your own risk. They also had fire buckets on the bridge because of the wood planking. That's not the only bridge, railways company bridge that had signs like that. Um, the houses again. And that's the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, that's coming through Southside. He's going to go into Homestead. They're going to go down to Duquesne. Eventually at Port Perry, uh, they're going to move in past Westinghouse, cross the Mon, go past Westinghouse, and join the main line. So that's what it looks like. Yep, travel at your own risk. That makes me feel real good about taking my car. I'm not sure what the streetcar operator had to do making six trips a day uh, across that bridge. But we'll do it anyway. It looks like a 55 car behind them. Uh, I'm sure these guys had to go slow and I'm sure they had to space themselves out while crossing this bridge. So a lot of industry, uh, small industry was located in Hayes. There was a stop, an aerial stop about where the car is and steps so that you could go down and uh, and get to your job if you wanted to work a bit. And it gives you a good look at the stop. Look at the planking on it. Look at that great car. I think it's a Buick, isn't it? But uh, it's a good view of the Glenwood Bridge, you know. Comment from one of the viewers, Bill, says that uh, that bridge was tough on your car's tires <laughs> oh really <laughs> oh <laughs> anybody ever blow a tire out on the bridge well there's the bno streets run branch uh which is still there today in the back uh, a lot i think all of these industries are gone doesn't look like this at all apparently they could pass yeah, there's a better shot of all the industries there All that manufacturing, just take a look at it. And uh, Dave Biles, or I'm sorry, Jim Schumann shot this, not Dave Biles. Um, he walked down. You can see the piers for the new Glenwood Bridge uh, being placed. That's what it looked like, though. Another aerial shot. And uh, like Ed Miller, Jim walked all this. Um, this area here, and I believe it was here, was a ramp that came down here and there was a trolley line that went along the B&O all the way to Rankin and into Braddock. Um, there was also a switchback off of this ramp and right in this area here past the piers was the materials yard 
with the Second Avenue Railway, so they could get rail and stone and another material by barge. One more shot. Okay, coming across that, that little ramp over the railroad, and we're in street trackage now, no more private right of way. Um, there's the ramp that takes you down into first Glenwood and then the Hazelwood, two neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. Go down here today and you will find literally nothing. Um, you don't even find complete retaining walls uh, to base a photograph on. And I know that because I did that. <laughs> Um, that building is gone. I mean, all of this, nothing here is gone. One of these may be here, but so much of these, these are all businesses, all apartments, um, and all gone. Um, and you can place that picture because that's the same building. And you can line up the street and you can see where the bridge lines up. And that's the only way. You, none of these steps are there. None of these concrete walls are there. There's really nothing here to tell you where you are. Now, I know where we are here. Second uh, Avenue, Glenwood Car House is over on my right. And uh, it was a big, big barn-like structure. And then there was a yard and an existing office building, the, the typical Pittsburgh Railways building for the dispatchers, the crew, car house manager. It's still there, and I believe it's the senior citizen center of some sort. Um, I just had to put this in because it's a yellow car, number one. And number two, these buildings, none of this exists. And look at this neighborhood. You know, look what it was like. It's hard to see where a lot of things were. Here's the barn. It's a big hulky thing, uh, plus the storage yard. It was dark inside from the one picture that we have uh, taken by the railways. That was American Avenue on the side, and it went in, and then you came into the back of the barn. Um, and a lot of the track like this was was then, you know, you had a back end, and, and uh, there was no loop here to my knowledge. And uh, only a few tracks, one or two, like like this one, that went through. So you pretty much, I guess, I guess you could back up from the ladder back here. It all looked like a lot of fun. Sweeper sitting there too. Now I put this in because look at the car number, guys, especially you operators. Forty three ninety eight was a McKeesport car. We have pictures of it on Route ninety nine. Uh, the Glassport uh, line, and then later Evans Avenue, 10th Ward. And he is coming by for whatever reason. Chartered sign, maybe. Maybe he's just coming back to the barn, and he doesn't want to pick anybody up. But beside that being our car, it's by Glenwood, of course, and, and it's nice to see some of these huge neighborhood buildings. And you can place this building based on where Glenwood, where American Avenue is, which is right here. So that would be the next block down. Sometimes the only way you can see it, car barns behind me, um, there's Malacton Street there. And uh, that that building, this this is really disguised. It's camouflaged here. And there's a church over to off to the picture, but I was able to identify that um, based on that. Now, if you're a rail fan, you go behind the barn. That's a great shot of the barn. You can see the ladder uh, in the barn and the vast cavernous building that's there. And also a whole lot of buildings in the neighborhood that don't exist. But, you know, if you're an Alco fan, the B&O had Alcos and Baldwins back there and F units. And, uh, you know, if you're a train buff, that's great. One of these Alco PAs is going to steam town. It should be there in a couple of days. And there's your typical row homes in Glenwood. That was Langton as well. Um, but you get an idea of what that street like. A little bit wider, you know, than Fifth Avenue in McKeesport. And uh, the buildings, when I got here in 75, more of these buildings were there. There were even very tiny buildings across the railroad. Um, this is actually a real blurry slide, but the church shows up. And uh, we're at Tecumseh, and that church is at Elizabeth Street. 
George, just some comments. Yeah. Uh, the, the chat thinks that that was actually an Alco FA. 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 Yeah, it might have been. Well, yeah, it might have been. It looks like it's only got two axles per truck. Okay. All righty. Not bad. I just love Alcos, though. Ah, okay. This part of the neighborhood, there's stuff still there. These two buildings behind the car are still there. They're still active businesses. We're moving into Hazelwood now, which is, was more the business area uh, than Glenwood was. Uh, so you can see some of these buildings are still there. Not all of the buildings, but some. Somebody took a color shot of a short turn, 56 A car, he'll turn at Muldowney. And we will get down to the intersection that doesn't exist. This was when 2nd Avenue crossed over the B&O, kind of almost on an X, and 2nd Avenue paralleled the Jones and Lachlan Steelworks. And there was no Irvine Street, as you can see. So the trolleys, uh, and I don't know what that Bennett Company Cumberland is. It looks like some kind of a bus. And maybe you bus fans can can let me know. But you had to be very careful at this crossing. There's a being a steam locomotive. Uh, and it was a main line and it was busy. Um, and it was not signaled, except for probably somebody here that come out with a stop sign. And the railways had a stop and the conductor had to come out and the conductor had to take a look at what was going on. Um, like that. He would flag the crossing he would you know look before he waved his motorman on now eventually irvine street's going to be built second avenue this is at hazelwood avenue is going to be over on the right side of the tracks and the city will build that in the 30s here's irvine street here and then they will close uh the street running right along the mill and today there's at least part of a road in there and you're not allowed in there. Comment from the chat from Edward Scooches, who says Hazelwood was a smelly stretch from the Coke works. It was. Hazelwood was smelly. The, when I was here in 75, the buildings uh, looked pretty wretched. It was an old neighborhood. It was a Hungarian neighborhood at one time. And there's still a Hungarian restaurant down in there that's not too bad. Uh, mostly it caters to groups. But the food's pretty good. So here we are on Irvine Street and they've opened it up here. And uh, you can see the old 2nd Avenue where the tracks were. Um, the b &O Railroad was is in there then. Behind the bushes, down below. And here's Allegheny Fence, which can still mark this location. Um, and there were footbridges. This banter probably here, but there were footbridges uh, up on my right. There were hillsides and there were steep stairs that went all the way up at the top of the hill, uh, the upper parts of Greenfield. And workers would go up and down to go to work. Now, a lot of those stairs are closed now. These footbridges are all gone. That building, I believe, is still there. But there's one of the typical footbridges. Um, you can, you know, you could walk up and down to get a streetcar to go to town, or go to McKeesport. Or you can go down and and work. And part of the JNL works on this side, as Ed said, had the Coke works, and these were open hearth, open hearth Coke works. And and I mean, I used to go down there, and you know, they smelled and they they were colorful, and you know, it was really something neat to see for me. Um, the other thing would be to go down to Homestead and watch them move train loads of glowing ingots. That was always exciting, too, for uh, in eastern Pennsylvania. That was, you know, grew up used to watching coal dumps burning by night. But you can see there and there's um, there is the furnaces. There were two furnaces there. And you would see them at uh, one time as you came along the parkway. And they're all gone today. One was closed and then another. And uh, so here's Greenfield Avenue coming down from the right behind the poles. Uh, B&O Railroad's Lachlan Junction. 
Uh, and the mainline train, of course, heading up to go through Oakland and, you know, cross the Allegheny River eventually. And the passenger line trains that went to the Grant Street Stub Station uh, would head down parallel to the trolley line, actually. This bridge is still here. There's a good view of the furnaces. This was used in the calendar at one point, and uh, Ed Leibarger was kind enough to send me, a, you know, about a 10 megabyte picture. So you get a good idea of the trolley coming around, uh, the B&O tracks, it was a Y here. Um, of course, lots of coal feeding the mills and, and the coke works. And there is a bridge, what's called today the hot metal bridge. It's an auto bridge. It's a bike, biking bridge. And JNL had plants on the other side of the river as well. And somewhere in all this, crappy background is is downtown typical pittsburgh atmosphere and you know the trolleys went this bridge is still like this trolleys went this way between or in the middle of the bridge now if you want to make a right you go on the right side and if you want to go up greenfield avenue you go in the middle and make a left but it's the interesting area I think the Allegheny Valley uses that railroad now. There's a great view of blast furnaces. That's Pittsburgh. Now we're back on 2nd Avenue. And I found this, not a great shot, uh, but it's M283 and we use this car on a regular basis to maintain our line, to build new track. And it was a Pittsburgh Railways crane built by differential in the 20s. And uh, look at look at all this uh, look at all this clean air coming out of the furnaces. <laughs> now back in the fifties, the sixties, we didn't have NIMBYs. People looked at that. People said everybody's working. That's a good sign. The red dust that you saw uh, in the early slide. That's a good sign. I wish some of these ectochrome slides. They're probably dupes, and they're never as clear as the originals. I wish they were sharper. I've tried to sharpen them, it doesn't work, but there's the blast furnaces. And uh, now I'm gonna run along the mill, it's over on my right. And you can see the steps are starting to be dismantled in some places, but, uh, or maybe not, maybe they're going up and then making a right-hand turn and coming up. That's, that's a typical, that was typically too, what this street looked like. Mill workers would park on the side on both sides. And before they concreted it, and tracks were still there when they did that. This was a horrid, horrid stretch of road. That's Lachlan Junction back here. And uh, you can see one of the engines getting ready to uh, go across that metal bridge, switch channel on the Carson Street side. Look at all the mill workers parking, pretty tight. Now they started to redo Second Avenue and you would have temporary crossovers. Um, I believe that's the Birmingham Bridge up there, Brady Street back then. Now it's called the Birmingham Bridge. And there's more of the uh, mill mill activity here along 2nd Avenue. So, <clears throat> Now, this is not 2nd Avenue, but it does show all of the steel mill activity on both sides of the Monongahela River okay at the brady street bridge that was number one and this provided traffic at least on this side of the river you know for the 56 and the 55 cars and to some extent the 58 cars the other reason i put this in okay who's got sharp eyes take a look at that car number anybody know what it is type it in the chat or uh, we own that. We're re restoring it now. And it's 1138. The second picture I've seen of 1138 in operation. And don't ask me how I won this on eBay. Usually the Pittsburgh people are crazy. Um, they spend billions of dollars on Pittsburgh slides. There's the Brady Street Bridge. Look at the stairways going up. And this part of Second Avenue now is not exciting. Parkway is built, of course, Parkway East, I-376. Uh, the track has been concreted here. There's the B&O passenger line. It's uh, part of it. It's a bike trail now. 
uh, and a walking trail. Boulevard of the Allies up on the upper right. Uh, there is the Liberty Bridge on the background. And I believe this industry was Duquesne slag. And at one point we had received a small steam locomotive from them and it's gone on to a home that probably appreciates it more. And there it is. That's the Dodge automobile car. I think Dodge was in Homestead and uh, Pittsburgh Railways would make money advertising the competition. You can see the Brady Street Bridge in the back. We're getting close to town. Uh, Parkway is up, up here um, and the Boulevard of the Allies going to Oakland. And here is the ramp going down to the Parkway East, going east. Somewhat older view, um, but they're they're concreting the track. We don't have a date here, but that old bridge was the bridge that crossed over, I believe still crosses over Second Avenue. And a bunch of yellow cars here. And there is the bridge, a new bridge. So I wanted to put the before and after. Um, and the B&O RDCs uh, from Connellsville and McKeesport um, using that track. And I found out a lot of, a lot of the B&O through trains, the ones going out to Chicago and Cincinnati and um, Cleveland, uh, they actually got on the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, down at Versailles, and came in over the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, and they discharged and picked up their passengers at Station Square on the other side of the Smithfield Street Bridge. And then they followed the PNLE up and somehow got back on their own line. But for commuter trains, um, the station was used. And in the end, I think it was all RDCs. I just thought this was a cool shot. There's Duquesne University and a whole bunch of houses that aren't there. That's all university now. None of that exists, modern buildings. Uh, look at some of the homes on Second Avenue. Um, as we're approaching uh, the, where the Boulevard of the Allies, Liberty Bridge, it all comes in there. And I know one day I was checking, there was an underpass by the Brady Street Bridge, and it was something like, you know, the boys of Second Avenue or something like that, painted um, on an abutment in 1930 or so was the date. It's pretty cool. But we will Joe, go uh, <clears throat> Joe Brantner mentioned that this was a very fast section of track. Mm. Well, I wish the, the car, I wish the car traffic today was as fast as Joe. <laughs> How are you doing, Joe? Um, I wasn't here to ride it, but um, I wouldn't know. But they do seem to have clearances for sure. Um, that's the Liberty Bridge ramps coming down and, and going over to the uh, boulevard. And uh, we'll be underneath that. And yeah, there's your fast section of track, Joe. Uh, not today, I guess. Um, it can be jammed up. Maybe this is rush hour. And maybe he's referring to the non-rush hour Saturday, Sunday. Uh, certainly, we didn't see that much traffic in those other slides. Uh, but this is a real mess. Cars trying to get in and out. And uh, it may be in the 1940s or so, late 40s between the war and maybe 1951 or two, because there's a yellow car uh, running, probably in a rush hour trip. Um, on 55 or uh, 56. Uh, we will turn onto Ross Street and uh, kind of a, an interesting shot. Look at the uh, overhead, but we'll go on Ross Street. We're coming back into town. Here's a Brentwood motor coach. Here's an outbound uh, trolley on Ross Street. Uh, back there, I think everybody calls these things the bridge of size. It leads from the jail um, to the courthouse. Well, you will find out your fate, I guess. Mutz Boulevard of the Allies up above. And then I have turned onto Fourth Avenue from Ross Street, which is right there where the black building, uh, dark building is, I think. And I believe we're getting to the end because we're up by the courthouse, Fourth Avenue, um, or City County building. I can't remember. That's definitely the jail in the back, though. Grant Street is the cross street. And they'll go all the way down Forbes and Stanwicks and up forth, and they'll do it again. Now, we know the Glassport was an issue and they abandoned service early um, in 19, uh, 1963 because of the high winds, the tornado 
that pretty much took down the trolley line, took all the overhead down, even knocked poles. And uh, they bust that for a day with Pittsburgh Railways vehicles. And then I think it was Noble Dick um, that whose buses took over the Glassport service. In this case, Pittsburgh Railways was able to operate right up to the end. And this was their orange buses. Uh, and there was Glassport. I wanted to talk about that. I'll have to switch these two slides. And because both of these lines were scheduled to be abandoned on the same day. Here's the poster. And they were abandoned on schedule. And there was no more trolleys down in the Mon Valley. September 1st, on the last rail service operated um, in the Mon Valley and through West Mifflin. So that's all I have. I don't even know what time it is. Um, and I hope I wasn't too long. And I'm saying let's eat because actually the last thing I ate was this morning. As Kristen said, oh, I had a very, yeah. very busy day. Well, I had a few cookies. I don't want to tell my doctor that I'm diabetic. Um, Anyway, any guys, if you guys have comments, any questions, any complaints, I'd love to hear them and, and I'm open here. All right. We will let everybody unmute themselves in just a second here. But before um, we head out, uh, first, I want to thank you, George, for uh, making a whole part two out of your presentation, going back into the city there. That was great. Um, before we get to questions, I want to mention a couple things coming up at the museum. We've got anything on wheels June 3rd and 4th. That'll be our annual uh, car show, truck show. We hope to have like school buses and construction equipment and transit buses. So all sorts of stuff. We'll have a June 3rd night photo shoot starting at eight o'clock and the uh, tickets for that will be $10 for members and $20 for non-members. We're hoping to take photos of streetcars alongside vintage period appropriate vehicles using our new volunteer boulevard, the brick paved street. So that'll be exciting. Our next trolleyology won't be until June 27th. So it'll be a while before we see everybody. That'll be the Mount Washington transit tunnel disaster um, program from the author of the book of the same name, Mary Jane Kuffner Hurt. So um, that'll be June 27th and the registration for that will be up uh, closer to that time. I want to thank everybody again for joining us today and thank you to George for presenting and let me make it so we can unmute ourselves here. Allow participants to unmute and at this time feel free to turn your video on as well. And uh, let's see some of you might need help turning that on if I came and turned it off. So you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, George, I tried to get in some of the comments, but of course there were some that came too. Uh, nice, nice comments in the chat. Thanks for the ride down memory lane. Great program. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments for George? Yes. Uh, George, I was talking, this is Joe Brander. I was oh, yeah, I can tell Joe. Hi. Yeah. I was talking about the, when they, they rebuilt the section of the, uh, uh, Second Avenue, the, the parallel to later the Parkway in 1954, as the Parkway was being built, they, they also caused the B&O to be relocated closer to the hill. Uh, <clears throat> and that became probably the one of the fastest stretches of track, trolley track on the system. Mm -hmm. And I can remember being on outbound cars, passing cars on the Parkway. <laughs> You would hit that S turn under the B and O, and people would be people would be mumbling, "He's going too fast." He's going. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they wanted to get home on time. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Kristen. Yes. Th th thank you for organizing this wonderful uh, presentation, George. Thanks for the presentation. Very and if welcome. anyone wants to get an idea about what the whether your ten or twenty dollars for the night photo shoot is worth, take a look at the picture behind me. That was taken <laughs> last year, last year. Yeah, it's, we're it's, hoping to uh, stage at least two or three, maybe four different scenes, and um, it'll be really neat with the with the antique automobiles there too. Well, Thanks you for know, the point, I, Edward. <laughs> I could only shoot what was there when I was there. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nicely lit, Ed. That's nice. 
Thank you. uh, Jeff has his hand up. Jeff, go ahead. Um, Forgive me if I asked this a couple of weeks ago, but what year did the B&O switch over to the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie in McKeesport? I don't know. (laughs) It was it was in the 50s, I believe. Oh, it was that far I back. I think it was um, in the 50s or very early 60s. And because I'm not actually a real fan, unless an Alco pulls it, um, well, <laughs> you know, grow up in Scranton, you head up there, and, and the only six axle Alcos in the world still running are up mm. there. Um, I'm not sure because I didn't grow up here, but I'm going to have to grab a B&O book or get on the internet and find out. Um yeah, if anybody has that uh, info, Probably I see late late the transit in the early, triangle there. <laughs> early 60s, or maybe one of you know. Uh, don't forget, I, I grew up here. I grew up in Philly and Scranton. So, you know, just like people here don't care about what happens east of the Alleghenies. <laughs> we never cared about west of the Alleghenies. Um, <laughs> I mean, we didn't know what it looked like. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, uh, David in the chat says his photo from the last night photo shoot won the East Penn photo contest. That's oh, wow. Cool. <laughs> hey. I was on that uh, show watching. Cool. Uh, any other questions or comments for George? Is anybody going to uh, the East Penn meet this weekend? Uh, I, I intend to be I intend to be there uh, Friday and then I'm ride the fan trip on Sunday and down in Philly. Very cool. Great. Some others in the chat saying they're going too. Well, um, as you guys know, probably uh, every other year, the meet is on the Western side of PA. So we are actually going to try to set some dates for the West Penn trolley meet for 2024 tomorrow. So we can have that information for the meet this weekend and have some little flyers and save the dates and all that kind of stuff for everybody. But um Plan ahead, June, sometime uh, in June of 2024. Yes, I hope to see you all yes, in Washington, PA, with our new building open and everything. Are you um, coming to the East Penn, Kristen? I am not. My parents are going to be in town, uh, and I don't know if they're uh, they're up for that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve looks like he's showing us something in the in the book there. Yeah, Transit in the Triangle, CRA Bulletin B145. <laughs> Uh, any other questions or comments for George? May I ask a general question of Pittsburgh? Is there anything new on the library line rebuilding? I haven't heard anything. Of course, I've been retired since 08, but I haven't heard anything. And uh, Chris Walker, who I think still finds out, we, we would probably know if it was in the newspaper. Or and the other. KDK, but I don't know that. You know what's happening in transit, if you look at Pittsburgh and you look at Philadelphia and you realize that two things are happening this year. Uh, the last of the pandemic money <clears throat> excuse me, for transit is being given out and the turnpike money goes from about $400 million to 50 uh, to be divided among all the transit authorities. And SEPTA is already talking about fair increases, service cuts, and a a big hold on the capital projects. I can only imagine that PAD is facing the same issues. They get less money than SEPTA. You know, they have a smaller system, but uh, they're probably facing the same issues. And ridership's never come back on either one of the systems. So yeah, I don't know any rebuilding and new light rail cars. And, you know, frankly, when I'm out taking pictures, if I go out there, you don't see that many people on the library cars till you start getting into Washington Junction. A question about the abandonments. Were there any people other than rail fans who were upset about the uh, uh, busing of the streetcar lines? Well, I wish I knew. Um, what was I in 1963? Yeah, well, you, you might have heard. Um, I was 12. Um, I would suspect there's a few people mad because um, the right away, the right away from Lincoln Place, okay? Think about it. You've, you've come up to Interboro and Mifflin Road, okay? The right away, the right away 
goes down through Muldani Loop, serves all those people by the Church of the Nazarene along uh, Interboro Avenue Extension, and it shoots across into the Morton plant, and it served that group, and then it shot down to the Horseshoe Curve, and there were the six or so houses that were down there. Didn't get back to the road until the cemetery, and they did have to reroute the bus the same way Pat runs it today. Um, they went up Mifflin Road, and they stayed on Mifflin Road. That became Buttermilk Hollow Road, you know, and, and uh, you know, they really couldn't serve <clears throat> all of those people that, that were there. So my guess is there were probably some people that were mad, and <laughs> what did you do? Um, one of the big factors here was the Glenwood Bridge, which the state was replacing. Uh, number one, the state had a policy of no tracks on the bridge. But I found at one point years ago some documentation in the archives that Pittsburgh Railway said, as long as you buy us the buses, we don't care. Yeah. I don't know if ridership wasn't that good um, or whether they were trying to get out of these long lines with right of way, with stretches of right of way where you don't have constant passengers. Uh, but they said, as long as you buy us the buses, we don't care. So the bridge opened in 63 and that expressway sprawl, which destroyed Hayes uh, and took a lot of people out uh, who were riders. And, uh, but I would, I would just have to guess that, you know, you never, you know, having worked for the transit authority, you know, you don't get anybody happy if you change the bus time five minutes. Imagine taking it away. You couldn't walk to a route anymore. So I guess there were complaints. How uh, frequent were the uh, streetcars to McKee's Port on each line? I never saw a schedule, to be honest with you. Um, I could imagine maybe every, you know, 15 or 20 minutes during the day, though. Uh, I think Tom Casterdale uh, is on line here. He's a member we never see. But he's got tons of schedules, so maybe maybe at some point he could look it up and uh, give me a call. You just got a comment in the chat from Chris Taylor, who says B&O had trackage rights on the PNLE starting in 1934 from McKeesport. Well, they did. That was the that was the the heavy freights and passenger trains, uh, because that was a water level route up north. Right. Uh, right. Their current line, if you, which I think Allegheny Valley runs, and maybe there's detour trains from B and O, Chessie, uh, went out Route Eight, and it was single track at one point. I think that it may have been double in places, uh, but it was a torturous climb, and uh, so they may have run, you know, downhill trains more than uphill on Route Eight. And back in steam days, can you imagine how many pushers you might have needed to get up there? Once you get over to Millvale and Aetna, uh, Aetna, I think, is where they went out, started to go up. <laughs> but thank you for that, 34. Okay. If somebody asked when uh, B&O changed in McKeesport to the p &E, it was 1970. I don't know when in 1970. But mm. Was it that, that was late? Wow. <laughs> hmm. Hi. I just wanted to say one thing. I know you said that they wouldn't allow trackage on the new Glenwood Bridge because the state of Pennsylvania wasn't allowing trolley tracks anymore on new bridges. Uh -huh. That's what I've always they heard. They, yeah. they weren't always consistent because they replaced the bridge in uh, in Johnstown in the late 50s and they allowed uh, new tracks. Yeah, and that was a late 50s thing. But yes. by the 60s, say now we're moving into the 60s, though. And, you know, I think the first mm -hmm. big issue here in Pittsburgh was building the interstate, um, Fort Pitt Bridge, Fort Duquesne Bridge, that whole mess. Mm -hmm. And they would not allow any kind of uh, rail crossing. And that took out the West End lines. Yeah, I know. Um Although I, I also read somewhere that Pittsburgh Railways wasn't unhappy about that either. No, no. And it may be that they were, I'm not sure, I'll be yeah. I honestly admit it, that they may have been inconsistent, or maybe Johnstown was a different case. Yeah. Um, but around here, you know, they Pittsburgh Railways in the early days fought them tooth and nail. 
um, to try to keep their trolleys running. And it just got to where, you know, the bridge in Sharpsburg, the 62nd Street Bridge, they fought mm -hmm. that, they lost. Yeah. And after a while, the whole thing was, if you buy us the buses, we have no money for buses, buy us the buses and we won't fight you. Yeah, that's a shame. Well, we had no and, energy and, crisis. And, back and then. also also about McKeesport, I know that they couldn't wait to get the trolleys out of downtown and yet... Uh, yeah, you apparently, could see. apparently, although I've never been to McKeesport, from what I you guys have said, there's nothing really left in downtown. Well, the McKeesport. town unfortunately has collapsed. Uh, yeah, and I got sure. here in '75. The mill was still running. The tube works were still running. Um, there were some beautiful houses that were already falling down, um, but the industry all left. And mm -hmm. uh, what happened? In you're in McKeesport and you're down in the valley. And about five miles up on Route 22, Monroeville Mall and Miracle Mile, and mm. every shopping center in, in the world was built up there right. to serve the suburban population. And it wasn't that hard to drive up there. Uh, Cox's department store was the last one there. And I mean, they could not compete. Mm. Uh, Gimbel's was an anchor in a mall that was closer to McKeesport. And that mall fell down because everything was up in, in Monroeville. Monroeville, it's still there. There's one of everything. I re actually, I remember, I remember going to Monroeville, the mall. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and anywhere you go, you know, that little mom and pop retail is smaller. They mm. can't buy in, you know, by the shipload. Uh, shipload. Um, yeah. It's suffering. Same like with hardware stores. Um, <clears throat> Uh, update, uh, Jeff Erlitz found the date for the B&O and the p, p &L -E was May 6, 1970. Is that wow, right? that late. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah, it was that late. <coughs> wow, thank you. I, I'm piece, really surprised it's that late. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, a piece of trivia from Bill. He says uh, the 56, 68, and 55 each crossed the Mon twice on their respective routes. <laughs> they did. Now that I think of it, they did. 